Graham McQueen. Graham was uh, born in Nova Scotia, a Buddhist scholar, retired professor of religious studies at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. He taught there from 1974 to 2003. He was the founder and former director of the Center for Peace Studies at McMaster. And in 2014, he ordered 2001, the anthrax this, uh, deception, the case for a domestic conspiracy. Now, Professor McQueen presents a uh, summary of oral testimony from first responders uh, to the lawyers panel for evaluation. As to whether this evidence corroborates the scientific evidence presented in the prior session and adds weight to a petition for a grand jury or potential future civil litigation, that's going to be for the lawyers panel uh, to evaluate. So without uh, further ado, Graham, we're waiting for you. Thank you very much. The focus of my talk will be on eyewitness evidence bearing on the explosive destruction of two buildings, the Twin Towers. I should say that I've spent years now trying to figure out what happened on that day, 9-11. Broadly speaking, that's historical research. And I feel However, historical research and research that is legally useful are two separate categories. And I'm happy to leave it to this panel to kind of translate what I'm giving and what people this morning gave into categories that you can use. I may make brief reference to some of that, but it's certainly not my area of expertise. I have one more comment to make as an, in an introductory way before getting into the meat of it. And that is uh, that we should think about the framing of this whole event. Frequently, people suggest that it's obvious that these buildings came down because planes hit them and damaged them, and that that was the original hypothesis. It's the natural hypothesis, and that people like me came slouching along after the event with our paranoid fantasies and conspiracy theories. We are revisionists. We are trying to change the original truth, and that is historically false. Right after the destruction of the first building on 9-11, both hypotheses that are being debated today were expressed, they were articulated, they were put forth. And neither one has priority in terms of time. The explosive demolition hypothesis was found all over the place on 9-11. It was found on mainstream news, for example, and here's one brief example. And we are also waiting for a statement out of the European Union. We had been told that EU would be issuing a statement shortly, and we will get back to you when we have that. Back to you, Mark. We have an enormous explosion now in the remaining World Trade Tower Center. In the, the second, I, I believe the North Tower is now gone as well. Right. Now, I didn't give that to prove that the buildings were explosively destroyed. I simply gave it to illustrate to you that this was common fare in the media on 9-11, and we should remember that. How about on the scene? You know, people who are actually there, who are participating. Here are two quotes. First, firefighter Christopher Fenio, directly after the destruction of the South Tower, he said, quote, a debate began to rage because the perception was that the building looked like it had been taken out with charges. Firefighters at the World Trade Center were debating that right after the destruction of the first tower. Even more strongly, FDN Fire Marshal John Coyle said, everybody, I think, at that point still thought these things were blown up. Okay? So my point is clear. It was an original hypothesis. We need no apologies for pursuing it. Our task is to choose between these two hypotheses, which have raged since the morning of 9-11. Structural failure because of plane damage 
and planned demolition. And now uh, let us begin to look at what an explosion witness might look like. I'm going to begin with a man uh, named Paul Lemos, a New Yorker, who was at the scene on 9-11 and who witnessed the destruction of the Twin Towers. Can you tell us your name? Uh, my name is Paul Lemos. All of a sudden I looked up and about 20 stories below, at least that's what it looked like to me, about 75 flights up below the fire, I saw from the corner, boom, 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 boom. Just like 20 straight hits just went down. And then I just saw the whole, the whole building just went, oh. and as the bombs were gone, people just started running. And I sat there and watched a, a few of them explode. And then I just turned around and I just started running for my life because at that point, World Trade Center was coming right down, right above us. In case you missed some of his very important words, here they are. All of a sudden I looked up and about 20 stories below the fire, I saw from the corner, boom, 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 just like 20 straight hits just went down. And then I just saw the whole building went, phew. and as the bombs, crucial word, were going, people just started running and I sat there and watched a few of them explode. And then I just turned around and so on. Now, uh, when we get testimony like this, or if you prefer a statement like this from a witness, what do we do with it? First of all, let me ask the question, where did this come from? Did this just float in anonymously on the internet? This is important if we're judging the quality of this evidence. No, it did not float in. I'll tell you how we got it. Attorney James Gorley in 2010 submitted a Freedom of Information Act request to NIST, at, attempting to get all the videos and films they used as part of their investigation of the destruction of the World Trade Center. And they ignored him. And he went back after them, and he, they ignored him. And this went on for months. So he finally filed a lawsuit in federal court. And there may be a lesson here for us about the usefulness of legal strategies, because he then got a wealth of information. And this interview, which you've just seen a small excerpt from, it's very rich, was part of that material. So that's how we got it. The other question we'd want to ask is, what's at stake here? Why is this important? Well, if what this man says he perceived, he truly perceived, then the whole official story of 9-11 that we've been given is false. The official story, just to remind you, has no room for explosions. They play no significant role in any of the official accounts of the destruction of these towers. And this man says he saw what he calls bombs. Let us interpret that as explosives, moving systematically and regularly and tearing the building apart. Now, if we were sincere investigators and we wanted to follow up on this, what would we do? There are a number of things we could do, but two of them would be, first of all, to seek corroborating evidence. Is there confirmation, both from other eyewitnesses and from non-eyewitness sources, such as you've seen earlier today? We would also want to look for disconfirming evidence. We want a hypothesis that can stand up to criticism. So if people have other explanations for what this man says he perceived, we would certainly want to look at those. Now, my time is not too long, but it's long enough to give you, I hope, at least a taste of what it would look like to follow those two routes. First of all, is there anything then that tends to corroborate? And I'm still well, to my yeah. witness. What do we do? Sorry, I'm sticking to eyewitness evidence since the other evidence has already been covered. Here are two firefighters interviewed very shortly after the destruction of the towers, and I suggest they corroborate what Lemos said. Nobody, yeah. Well, fuck, what did we do? We made it outside, we made it about a block. 
We made it at least two blocks, and we started running. Four by four, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if it had detonated. Yeah, yeah it was detonated. They were yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. I was watching it and running. It just ran up. And then you just saw the, this cloud of shit chasing you down. Okay. The crucial words, again, just to make sure we're all on the same page. One man moving his hand, floor by floor, it started popping out. Tardio then moves his hand. It was as if they had been detonated, detonated, you know, as if they were planted to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. And the other man confirms it. Now, quite apart from the words they use, it's astonishing that these two independent pieces of film show men using exactly the same gestures, all three of them. And these gestures are clearly meant to indicate that they perceive distinct impulsive events at regular intervals, moving down the buildings and tearing them apart. So I, con I consider that strong corroboration. I consider these very rich statements. Now you may be thinking that's all well and good, but this is three eyewitnesses. Is that all you got? It isn't all we've got. But if you were to ask me how many eyewitnesses there are who perceived or thought they perceived explosions, I would have to say, who knows? As far as I know, the FBI never made an attempt to do a comprehensive set of interviews of eyewitnesses in which they would ask them precisely that question. This is astonishing, given that this was a, a crime scene in which they were, uh, they were in charge. And that's one of the first things you would do is comprehensive interviews with witnesses. I will say a little bit later about what NIST and FEMA and 9-11 Commission report do with such uh, witness accounts. But essentially, um, we don't know if the FBI has their own private account. So civil society, and I'm a member of civil society, obviously, has had to take on the task of this kind of forensic study ourselves. And there's more than one collection, but my own personal collection, which I built up through a lot of hard work, has 156 eyewitnesses to explosions. And I, I want to say a word about how I constructed this. It's not comprehensive. It doesn't, it, it doesn't collect all the eyewitnesses but I'm comfortable with it because I know the criteria that were used to construct it. And I'm going to use it as a basis of the talk. Now this is one way of arranging the eyewitnesses by key word. You see, I didn't want to compile a list which said in effect, this is what Graham McQueen thinks, right? This is the list he, of people he thinks saw explosions. I wanted it to be more objective than that. I wanted to remove myself somewhat from the scene. So I chose, after having read the 12,000 pages of the oral uh, testimonies of the firefighters, I chose keywords, read the sources again, made the lists, and here you have the result. So you can see at the bottom, by far the largest number of these eyewitnesses used the word explosion, or a verbal form, like to explode. Then we have blast, bomb, blow up, implosion, and a few others. This allows me to keep a, a little bit of arm's length in my interpretation here. In other words, this is a group of people who themselves said they perceived explosions. That's the point. Now, uh, there are various ways of dividing up this list of 156 eyewitnesses, and I want to show you another way because it allows me to make some other comments. Here I list them by profession. You see the by far the largest number are FDNY, that is, Fire Department of New York. Next is PAPD, the Port Authority Police Department, then reporters, and then a variety of other civilians. I find this a useful graphic because I think the strengths, evidentially, of the two columns on the left are somewhat different in nature from the strength of the two columns on the right. The two columns on the left here indicate, first of all, government employees, US government employees. Secondly, they're all people who have far more experience with explosions than most of us. And thirdly, and very importantly, 
they, the documented evidence that I'm talking about is part of reports and records made in their normal course of their work. And may, for that reason, be legally useful, even though these were made out of court. And I want to give you an example of what, what these documents look like. First of all, the FDNY documents. Shortly after 9-11, FDNY Commissioner Thomas von Essen decided it would be very important to have a complete record of what the FDNY members saw and experienced on 9-11. So he established the World Trade Center Task Force. There were about 500 interviews, altogether about 12,000 pages, in which members of the FDNY were interviewed by other officers in the organization. And these were taped, the tapes were transcribed, and initially the public did not have access to them. The New York Times thought that we should have access to them and took the city of New York to court. And this is a second example of the usefulness of legal processes in getting crucial evidence. Because the New York Times won, and this was released, and it has proven to be a treasure trove of evidence. Now, this is what the FDNY records look like close up. Here's an example. File number at the top, World Trade Center Task Force interview, firefighter Richard Banachiski, interview date December 6, 2001, transcribed by so-and-so. If we turn the page, we get even more information. Battalion Chief Kenahan gives the date, gives the time, 3.30 p.m., identifies himself, identifies the person he's interviewing, and then asks a very, fi a very fine open-ended question. Please tell us the events of September 11 as you recall them. And that's pretty typical. But for the most part, people are given the freedom to tell the story of what they experience. Some of them tell it in two pages. Some of them tell it in 20 or 30 pages, a great deal of variety. And the interviews began shortly after 9-11 and continued into early 2002. Now, in this case, what does Mr. Banachiski say? I've chosen one selection, so you'll see what it looks like. We were there, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then I just remember there was just an explosion. It seemed like on television they blow up these buildings. It seemed like it was going all the way around, like a belt, all these explosions. So that gives you a little idea of what these records look like. Very substantial, extremely rich. Now I want to show you briefly what the Port Authority Police Department record looked like. In this case, we're not dealing with interviews. We're dealing with police who simply wrote their reports as part of their normal everyday record keeping and submitted them to their superior officers. Typed in some cases, handwritten in other cases, and I'll choose a handwritten instance. Port Authority of New York and New Jersey handwritten memorandum to Inspector Norris from police officer Sue Keen, March 14th, 02. These are a little bit later, but still pretty close to the event. On the above date, I responded for my detail at Manhattan courts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. She got there very early. And notice her last line. Writing this down has not been easy. This is my third attempt. This is a traumatized person. It comes through in several of her statements. But let's look at one of the pages of her statements. Massive amounts of debris, concrete dust, and bodies or parts were more frequent at this point. Then there was an eerie silence, and it was like you knew something was going to happen. There just seemed to be one explosion after another. I was separated from the guys from the bridge by another explosion, massive again, sucking the air out of your lungs. And then just a wind more intense this time with larger pieces of debris flying and so on very rich stuff. And I should say, Officer Keene was a police officer for something like 14 years. And before that, she was in the US Army. And she says she was trained on how to respond to explosions. It's a credible witness. Now, you've seen a brief indication of what the FDNY and PAPD 
uh, folks look like, the, the quality of that documentation. The reporters and other, that is the, the two other columns, are quite different in their strengths. And yet they do have strengths. Many of these are video records, and many of those video records were captured right in the thick of things on the day. Some people were wounded physically, psychologically, and they made spontaneous statements whether or not these would be accepted in court as excited utterances or present sense impressions or whatever, I don't know. This will be up to you folks. But in any case, they, they are saying things spontaneously without reflection, without having a hypothesis that they're pushing, without an ideological agenda or some conspiratorial mindset. And I will choose just one example to give you the flavor. And this is a reporter, N.J. Burkett, working for ABC News, and standing right in front of the towers. Okay, All right, take one, take one and two, one. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the two towers, the debris continues to fall, it's a rain on the people below. There are people hanging from the windows, 90 stories up, and a number of bodies have actually hit the pavement. Another one? Take two. Take two and two, one. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents. In case you missed what he said, a huge explosion now, raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. And that's where it breaks off because he and his cameraman run for their lives. Later on, he also has to flee for his life when the next tower comes down. And he refers to that as a blast. Okay, well, this will have to do in my brief presentation for corroborating evidence. And I now want to turn to apparently disconfirming evidence, or to put it differently, explanations that people, explanations people have come up with for why we shouldn't take these uh, too seriously. <clears throat> the first, objection is, how do we know that these people really perceived explosions? They heard loud sounds, big deal, could have been falling bodies, crashing elevators, snapping columns, and so on. Frankly, I find that many of the people who make this objection are naive and have not done their homework. They seem to assume that everything people like me are talking about is just vague, big sounds person heard a bang, person heard a boom. I'm sorry, but if that's all you've got, you don't even make it to the list of 156. You haven't identified it as an explosion. Moreover, we're not just talking about auditory perception here. People saw things, they felt things, and these can't be explained in these simple ways. For example, police officer Kruger from the Port Authority Police Department while searching the floor, there was a tremendous explosion knocking me off my feet onto the floor. Even more dramatic, Port Authority Police Officer Leclerc. Suddenly there was a monstrous explosion with extremely high wind and debris and the lights went out immediately. I was physically picked up and hurled across the concourse, slamming into a wall. I wouldn't want to be the one to tell Officer Leclerc that he didn't really experience an explosion. We can be a little more specific when we try to analyze the data that we've got in arguing in favor of an explosion. I've used James Thurston. Uh, James Thurston is a former FBI explosions expert, and he wrote a book, Practical Bomb Scene Investigation, in which he outlines six characteristics of explosions. And I've matched them up with statements from Sue Keen, the officer we met before who did the handwritten testimony. And this is what it looks like. <clears throat> First, the distinctive sounds of explosions. Sue Keen says, a couple of minutes later, it sounded like bombs going off. That's when the explosions happened. 
second characteristic, positive blast pressure phase, where it moves out, the pressure wave moves out from the point of origin of the explosion, pushing air in front of it. The windows blew in. We all got thrown. Each one of these explosions picked me up and threw me. Now, of course, when the air rushes away from the point of origin of the explosion, a vacuum is created at the point of origination, and that, that is a characteristic. What does she say? There was this incredible rush of air, and it literally sucked the breath out of my lungs. Nature abhors a vacuum. Next phase is going to be negative blast pressure phase, when things get dragged back and the air is restored toward the point of the explosion. Negative blast pressure phase. Everything went out of me with this massive wind. Stuff was just flying past. Then it stopped and got really quiet. And then everything came back at us. I could breathe at this point, but now I was sucking all that stuff in too. It was almost like a backdraft. It sounded like a tornado. Five, incendiary or thermal effect. He threw me under the hose, which in a way felt great because I didn't realize until then that my skin was actually burning. I had burn marks. Not like you'd have from a fire, but my face was all red, my chest was red. And finally, six, fragmentation and shrapnel. There was stuff coming out of my body like you wouldn't believe. It was like shrapnel. It's still coming out. Now what I take from all this is that, of course, they were experiencing explosions. This is an objection that does not hold up, and is based on sloppy scholarship. The next objection is, well, okay, there were explosions, big deal. We all know that there are various kinds of natural explosions that frequently accompany fires, especially big fires in high rises. It could have been that. Why do you go from explosion to explosive? There's a big gap there. Well, this is a more sophisticated objection, and it has a certain initial plausibility. But again, I think it doesn't hold up to careful study. I mean, we know what these natural explosions are that accompany fires. They're outlined in the NFPA National Fire, yes, NFPA guide. And we know what they can and can't do and what their characteristics are. And I suggest to you that the eyewitness evidence rules them out. There are three categories, three features of the eyewitness testimony that I especially want to draw your attention to. And I call them identification, pattern, and power. Identification simply means, of course, firefighters are trained about these ordinary explosions they may encounter. They know what they are. They know how to recognize them. They know what to do. So do they identify the explosions they encountered in the towers according to these usual categories? Almost without exception, they do not. And here's a way of explaining what I'm saying. 31 separate members of the Fire Department of New York used the term bomb when describing what they experienced. The next point is I call pattern. You already saw in the first couple of videos that I showed that they were talking about patterns of explosions with regular intervals and so on. None of the natural explosions we would expect to accompany a fire exhibit that. And I'd like to give you two more examples of testimony from the fire department uh, members that bear on this issue of patterns. Let's start with one that is talking about auditory patterns, sounds. Firefighter Daniel Rivera, speaking of the South Tower. So he's being interviewed here. Rivera says, then that's when I kept on walking close to the South Tower, and that's when the building collapsed. Interviewer asks him, how did you know that it was coming down? Rivera, that noise, it was a noise. Interviewer, what did you hear? What did you see? Rivera, 
It was a frigging noise. At first I thought it was, do you ever see professional demolition? When they set charges on certain floors and then you hear pop, 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 pop. That's exactly what I thought it was that. When I heard that friggin' noise, that's when I saw the building coming down. One other testimony worth giving here. Emergency Medical Service Captain Karen DeShore, quote, somewhere around the middle of the World Trade Center, she's talking about the North Tower, there was this orange and red flash coming out. Initially, it was just one flash, then this flash just kept popping all the way around the building and that building had started to explode. Popping sound. And with each popping sound, it was initially an orange and then red flash came out of the building and then it would just go all around the building on both sides as far as I could see. These popping sounds and the explosions were getting bigger, going both up and down and then all around the building. And finally, I think that explanation does not work because of the, the feature that I'm calling power. None of the explosions that typically accompany fires could destroy these massive, robust buildings. And yet one eyewitness after another says that's exactly what they saw. For example, firefighter Gary Gates speaking of the South Tower, I looked up and the building exploded. The whole top came off like a volcano. Well, that rules out, that rules out the normal kinds of explosion. We're getting toward the end of my talk, but I do have one more question to answer. How did the authorities who produced all these official reports deal with this material? Answer is brief, they didn't. FEMA did not mention it. NIST. I read 4,000 pages of NIST reports and there was not one single mention of this, even though they had access to all the same materials I did. You would not even know, have known that there were eyewitnesses who thought they heard explosions or saw them. The 9-11 Commission report in its 935 pages has one sentence fragment. It says there were some firefighters in the North Tower Quote, here it is, those firefighters not standing near windows facing south had no way of knowing that the south tower had collapsed. Many surmised that a bomb had exploded. And that's it, folks. That's all there is. This is so extraordinarily deceptive. Most eyewitnesses were not in the north tower. Many eyewitnesses were looking directly at the towers. They did not have impeded vision. And I've given you examples of this already, but I'll give one more, and he will be my last quotation, firefighter Kenneth Rogers. We were standing there with about five companies, and we were just waiting for our assignment, and then there was an explosion in the South Tower. A lot of guys left at that point. I kept watching. That's the key, key line. I kept watching. He was looking directly at it. And what did he see? Floor after floor after floor, one floor under another after another. And when it hit about the fifth floor, I figured it was a bomb because it looked like a synchronized, deliberate kind of thing. To sum up for you, ladies and gentlemen, I think that this last witness was not only a good eyewitness, I think he was a very smart man who made the right conclusion. All my studies of the eyewitness testimony and of the non-eyewitness testimony have led me to conclude that he was right, that explosives brought down these buildings, and that we are dealing with a synchronized, deliberate kind of thing. Thank you for your patience. Graham, don't leave. We have a question for you. So, Judge, you have a question? A question, sir? Good evening, sir. I met him uh, in Toronto. 
If Professor Graham Greene is important, credible witness. Nevertheless, it seems to me he is only indirect witness. Uh, it seems to me. Uh, as he did not uh, show directly the collapse of the uh, tower, he, he has made uh, a nice investigation and he interviewed different uh, individuals about the dynamic of the so we know that uh, our code and due process of law uh, did not uh, does not allow to use the uh, indirect uh, witness uh, I, I mean okay at least that the, the direct uh, witness uh, are died or or irreparably. So uh, I have to ask the professor if he has uh, written the name of the individuals that he questioned, if he uh, gave to the FBI or the police or the prosecutor his dossier in order to ask to investigate this person because it seems to me that uh, uh, several of these witnesses are irreparable are, uh, it is impossible to found them so, uh, 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 as i uh, believe that he is a very important witness we he must help us in finding the direct witnesses and uh, and in uh, giving us also the documents that allow us to speak with the direct uh, witness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are several points in there. <clears throat> I don't know if I can answer them all. First of all, I am going to be handing to the panel the list of all 156 people with their names and their exact testimony, as near as I can figure out where they were, when they were, when they gave the testimony, and so on. Secondly, I realize these are in, this is considered indirect. That in other words, they, these are out of court statements. They were not made under oath. And therefore, this is an example of where I say these are historically of extreme importance. Whether they are admissible legally, right, will be, I think, up to you guys to figure out. I tried to give a couple of little hints in that direction because I'm aware that there are exceptions to the hearsay rule including certain kinds of records and certain kinds of spontaneous statements. But whether or not that will work, I don't know. The other way to go is to say, look, this isn't ancient Rome we're talking about here. This is New York City 15 years ago. A lot of them are still alive. For heaven's sakes, why don't we bring them into a process, either affidavits or in court or whatever? I'm not the guy to do that. And if it is done, it has to be done very well. You may only get one chance at it. You don't want to blow it. But these are different routes that may be taken. We must uh, try to find them. So uh, if, if they are irreparable, we, can, we don't find. We can use your witness. Hmm. Yes. Yes, you can we use can the list. Tell that it was the code, the criminal code. Yeah that uh, if the direct uh, witness, it is impossible because of that, of the death of the, the, the disappear, disappearition, that we can use your witness that is very, very important and credible. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's fine. So, uh, we're running short on time, but I unfortunately will have to exercise the prerogative of the chair here and make a statement myself. I apologize to those who are wanting us to proceed. But uh, first of all, Judge, be assured you're essentially preaching to the choir to this panel of lawyers in terms of the need to get the original witnesses and eyewitness testimony under oath from the people who were there. So that, rest assured, your advice is, is received. Uh, on the other hand, I do agree with Dr. McQueen that there are exceptions under the federal rules of evidence for admissibility of certain 
testimonies or statements out of court. Uh, not necessarily the preferred evidence, but it is allowed in some circumstances, such as excited utterances, uh, present sense impression, and the recording of these statements made by the, uh, I believe it was the state government of New York, to archive these firefighters' testimonies may qualify as a public record exception. So it's not like this information wouldn't be receivable in a court, but your point is still well taken. To be persuasive, uh, you would want the best evidence you can lay your hands on. Normally, that would be the eyewitnesses. I also will uh, just make a quick note, since it's relevant here. Uh, you'll hear it again in a moment. Uh, grand juries in the federal system are not only allowed to hear evidence that is not admissible, they're allowed to issue a presentment leading to an indictment based entirely on hearsay. That's the federal system. So the information is very valuable. We thank you, Dr. McQueen. Thank you.